Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Fletch, Fletcher Crow. I'm the uh, chair this year of the uh, UCG Sunday Seminar Committee. And uh, every Sunday, we try to have a seminar like this that uh, really tries to, uh, to bring us up close and personal with a lot of the issues that are uh, rolling around. And this morning, we are very uh, honored and delighted to be able to have Dr. Paul Ortiz from the uh, University of Florida Department of History. <clears throat> Many of you that are on here know Paul already. He's, he's really a well-known person in Gainesville. Um, he's the director of the Samuel Proctor Oral History uh, Project and the author of some books that uh, you either have read or need to read, one or the other. Um, he wrote uh, An African-American and Latinx History of the United States. And uh, he uh, wrote Eman Emancipation Betrayed and Remembering Jim Crow. So he is a really uh, card carrying expert in the topic that we're gonna be talking about this morning, this whole question of uh, critical race theory. I think everybody here knows that critical race theory has been on the front page of newspapers, both in Gainesville and around the nation uh, now for many months. And it's gotten to be a, a very hot, hot, hot topic. So we're really uh, delighted to have Paul with us. And um, I want you to uh, say hi to Paul. And uh, he's going to be talking for 40 minutes. Uh, during that time, uh, participants will be muted. But uh, you can enter your questions in the chat. And uh, Don Lopez-Smith and Tim Martin are here to uh, <clears throat> walk us through the uh, uh, issues of being, uh, acknowledging one by one the, uh, the questions that are in the uh, chat box. And we'll be trying to uh, answer each one of those. So thank you very much for attending. And now, Paul, it's over to you. Well, thank you so much, Fletch. And thank you so much, the United Church of Gainesville. Um, I have so many friends and colleagues um, at the United Church. Uh, just, I'm always thrilled to be able to share fellowship with you all. Um, uh, I also see many friends of the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program, uh, which I have the great honor to direct. Uh, many of you have um, uh, sat for interviews with our students and have really contributed to the rich uh, history and understanding, um, not only Gainesville, but many of you have been interviewed uh, because of your, your professional uh, backgrounds and experiences. So on behalf of the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program, also I wanna thank you uh, for being here this morning. So I wanna talk about uh, critical race theory, specifically uh, Governor DeSantis's uh, rule against uh, critical race theory. Um, it isn't a, a, a formal bill yet, it's a rule. And so we may talk about the dis some of those distinctions. Um, I also wanted to share with you, a number of you had contacted me in advance to ask me, one of, one of the hats I wear, of course, uh, is I'm also president of the Faculty Union, United Faculty of Florida. And again, thank you. We have so many uh, UFF members on the call this morning and also retirees who are longtime members of United Faculty of Florida, our faculty union. Um, many of you asked me in advance about HB 233, which is seen as almost a, a, a partner of the anti-critical race theory rule, HB 233, uh, we have filed a lawsuit against. That's essentially the bill uh, which would require us to fill out uh, political surveys, uh, essentially revealing what our political uh, opinions are, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so our union has actually uh, uh, filed a lawsuit against that just this past week. We're in the process of finalizing that. You'll hear more about that in the newspaper um, as time comes on. As I'm kind of preparing here and getting ready to do my screen share, I also want to share with you the rule, um, the so-called anti-critical race theory rule promulgated from the Florida Board of Education. Um, I put uh, this also in the chat bar. It's that second link on Google, Google Docs. If I did it correctly, uh, you if you have Word on your computer or something like that, you should be able to click that and it should be accessible. Um, if not, um, I have a screen share a bit later. So this morning, I wanted to talk a, about really kind of focus on three things. You know, what is critical race theory? Um, why are uh, uh, powerful institutions across the country uh, trying to attack critical race theory? Um, a little bit about U.S. history and, and why I argue we need to understand critical race theory 
uh, and, and its allies to really get to the core of understanding things like racism, but especially the struggle against racism and the struggle against anti-Semitism. And my argument that I'm developing, and it's really a work in progress, and I look forward to you to kind of thinking out loud with you, is that I believe this rule against critical race theory is actually um, illegal in many ways because it undermines a lot of existing Florida statutes on why we need to study things like the Holocaust, slavery, the Civil War, Hispanic history. These are all part of the Florida statutes on education. And my argument is that the latest rule promulgated by Governor DeSantis actually undermines and in fact uh, uh, makes it impossible for us to understand things like the Holocaust or slavery without really getting to the core of what racism was and what racism is. So I'm going to, because I'm a history professor, you know I have to have slides for you. And so I'm gonna go over to my screen here. And so what is critical race theory? So, a number of years ago, a number of really brilliant scholars and Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, uh, who is a professor, distinguished professor now of law at Columbia Law School, was one of the real early founders of critical race theory, along with Richard Delgado. Uh, many of you also are familiar with the work of Derek Bell, um, a longtime uh, legal studies professor at Harvard and NYU. And the thing that's important, I think, about Professor Crenshaw's work, especially, is not only is she one of these founding theorists of critical race theory, uh, but she's also a founder of the intersectionality uh, approach to studying race relations. And I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, frankly, I think a lot of attacks against her because uh, are, are a lot of people attack her because she's a prominent African American female scholar, and a lot of people in our society still do not like that and she's very outspoken, she's brilliant. Um, I've had the honor to, to listen to a number of her lectures and read a number of her papers. Um, and I, I would just uh, really lift up her work to you if you want to continue to read more about critical race theory. So what is critical race theory? A brief primer. And I, you know, I, there's a kind of a joke that goes around about critical race theory, which goes as follows. Um, as you read the slide, I'll just kind of give you the, the, uh, the, the joke, which is that if your child is in a uh, place where they're being taught or studying critical race theory, congratulations on getting your child to law school. Because <laughs> that's really the place where critical race theory is taught. Um, there's a lot of miseducation about critical race theory. Governor DeSantis um, was saying that critical race theory is in K through 12 schools in Florida. Uh, that's false. Uh, that's not correct. Uh, critical race theory is a very rarefied way of looking at the institutions and the struggle against racism. We use it in primarily in higher education, but I only actually teach critical race theory uh, with my advanced graduate students. Um, I generally don't even cover the, the topic with my undergraduates at the University of Florida. And I wish I could give you a more complicated definition of it right now, but this is basically it, y'all. Um, it's the idea that race is a social construct. That is, race is not biological. Race is something we create. Racism is not a natural thing. People are not born to be either pro-racist or anti-racist. It's a part of the, the society that they grow up in. That's what we mean by race as a social construct. And most importantly, Racism is not merely the product of individual bias or prejudice, but also something embedded in legal systems and policies. And so what this means as a scholar or as a conscientious citizen, if you want to challenge racism, you want to create a more equitable society, you want to create a society based on equal justice under the laws, you have to understand and examine and explore your society's institutions. The institutions could be corporations, they could be laws, they could be the entertainment industry, they could be all of the above. 
But the idea here is if you want to really successfully eradicate racism from the society, it isn't just about me saying, oh, uh, uh, Fletch, I want you to be opposed to racism as an individual. And then me asking every single person on the Zoom call, oh, I would like you to, to make a pledge against racism. It's more, much more complex than that. It means looking at our institutions. They could be religious institutions. They could be churches. They could be mosques. They could be synagogues. That's essentially what critical race theory is. It's the, it's the exploration of institutions to understand how things like bias and racism are perpetuated. But again, most importantly, how we eradicate those things, how we create a more equal society. So what do people have against critical race theory? What's the beef against critical race theory? And the thing I'll, I'll highlight at the outset is that under Governor DeSantis's new rule, under the Florida Board of Education's new rule against critical race theory, it places critical race theory on the same level as Holocaust denial. Think about that for a moment. Governor DeSantis has placed critical race theory on the same level as Holocaust denial. And I'll show you this in a moment because I'm gonna show you the rule, right? You don't have to take my word for it. But I wanted to get into the politics of this a little bit and to reveal to you two organizations which obviously are promoting this war against critical race theory. Uh, one of them is called the Florida Citizens Alliance. Many of you are familiar with this group. It's a very powerful right-wing organization funded by the, the Koch uh, network. We used to call these the, the Koch brothers, but now the, the correct term is Koch network. The Florida Citizens Alliance has been promoting this war, this, this battle against critical race theory. And the question I have for everyone at this moment, I'm not going to answer this question. I want us to think about it. Why would the Florida Citizens Alliance be opposed to critical race theory? And I've just listed a few of their very well-known public activities. The Florida Citizens Alliance advocates the banning of Toni Morrison books from K through 12 public schools. They advocate the banning of Frank McCourt's Angela's Ashes. They advocate the banning of Pearson's Essentials of Oceanography. I mentioned climate change. And so um, I'm not gonna answer the question for you, why would they be opposed to critical race theory, I want us to think about it and kind of collectively, you know, come up with an answer. Another organization, uh, which is funded by the Koch Network, which is promoting this war against critical race theory is a group called Campus Reform. Um, they have been sending our faculty at the University of Florida, um, what I would consider harassing messages. I'm not going to read this whole message um, on my left to you. But essentially, um, it's rather absurd. This is an organization which uh, pretends it's some kind of journalistic outfit, but then you can see here it's asked. It starts by um, doing something very unjournalistic, which is asking a leading question. Uh, uh, and these are right. By the way, these today are being sent to faculty at the University of Florida, and I would call these baiting questions. There, and I and I, and I tell my colleagues, and I, I've received these too. Um, I, I just don't answer them. Because, you know, just reading that last part, additionally, as a professor, do you believe directing students to use a certain lens for analysis, as opposed to independent thinking, is the most beneficial method of instruction? Obviously, an absurd question not meant to be answered. Because if you're going to study your society, you have to have a theory. So the notion that you would, would try to study the society without any theory whatsoever is akin to saying, oh, I can become a chemist without understanding the, the, uh, the theory, uh, the theories underlying, you know, basic chemistry, right? Um, so anyway, these are two of the many organizations, very well funded, again, by the Koch Network, opposed to critical race theory. So here's the rule. And I, again, I put the rule in, in the chat bar. Um, you can, and I can do that again for folks who just arrived a bit later. Um, this is the, the, the rule pretty much in its entirety. What's interesting about this, again, is, is, is it's contradictory at its, at, at its outset. Um, it's insulting. Again, placing Holocaust denial and critical race theory in the same space and arguing that they're essentially the same thing. And it undermines our ability to understand the roots of racism and undermines our ability to understand basic U.S. American history. 
Uh, it's an attack on the 1619 project, which is something we can talk about um, during Q&A. Um, but it's this notion that you, it's steering us away from understanding race and racism as systems of oppression that we have to think about how do we dismantle these systems um, and really um, getting us to understand the United States as a nation, as you see in the conclusion here, as a nation based, uh, based largely on universal principles stated in the Declaration of Independence. Now that's great lofty words, but we're gonna see how problematic that is in a moment. These are the statutes, I believe, that this new rule actually um, contradicts and undermines. Because again, to understand the origins of slavery, and see this is one of the statutes that, that one of the Florida statutes that all K through 12 teachers are required to, um, uh, to teach, right? Uh, Paul, can, Paul, can you hear me? Um, we, we may have a glitch with the sound system right this second, and uh, Don Lopez Smith may have uh, dropped off for a second. Um, <clears throat> is, is everybody able to uh, hear Paul okay right now? Raise your hand. Much, I think it's fine. I think it was just one participant was having problems. Just one participant. Yeah. Okay. So, so Go everything proceed. Everything's doing fine then. Uh, Paul, go right ahead. Okay. Thank you. Oh, and I'll take that station break, by the way, Fletch, to take advantage of the fact I'm, I'm, I'm wearing an Alachuay County Labor Coalition t-shirt this morning, and, uh, but my camera doesn't allow me to show the whole thing. I just wanted to also just thank everyone who's a part of the Alachuay County Labor Coalition um, and, uh, because it's such a wonderful organization. So that's my product placement pitch. Love the Labor Coalition. Back to the Florida statutes. So the Florida statutes... Um, and these are part of the constitution for K, I should elaborate for K through 12 teaching. Right now, the anti-critical race theory uh, uh, rule applies mainly to K through 12 teachers in public, public schools in the state of Florida. But you see that that critical race theory rule is preceded by this rule under section 1003.42.2. Okay, so these are things that all Florida teachers in public schools, all Florida districts, I should say, are mandated to teach. Now, this is going to lead to our action item. And those of you who have seen my talks and been with, with me and, and I've seen many of your talks know that there's got to be an action item here, right? So this I'm kind of flashing ahead to you towards the action item. We are required in all 67 school districts to teach these things, the development of slavery the enslavement experience, abolition, the Holocaust, civil war, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, so let's just keep that in mind, the study of Hispanic contributions to the United States. And oh, most recently, we are required to teach, and this is actually a house bill, and this was passed last year, and I had the privilege of being able to do research for the uh, Senator Bra Randall Bracey's legislative team that put this, this bill together, all 67 school districts are now required to teach about the ECOE election day riots that occurred in Florida in 1920. That's very important to keep in mind as we think about this rule against, against critical race theory. So here's some problems. There are many problems with this rule against critical race theory. And you, you've heard me say this before, my argument is here is that to understand any of these major historical events or processes, you know, such as the Ocoee massacre, talk about the struggle against racism, you have to connect that to the struggle against sexism, the struggle against anti-immigration hysteria, uh, the struggle against um, uh, people with disabilities, right? That's what intersectionality means. And that's why Professor Crenshaw insists you have to understand institutions and laws and things like that to really uh, uproot all these, these uh, inequalities. The reality, and those of you who study social movements and have been part of social movements like the Latchway County Liberal Coalition and others, you know that it's taken centuries and generations for those of us, the people out of doors, and that was a phrase from the, the, that was commonly used in the 16th and 17th century, the people out of doors uh, essentially is us, 
the non-elites, right? The 99.9%, it's taken generations and centuries for us to actually become part of the active citizenry of the US American polity, the suffrage movement, the civil rights movement, the struggle against uh, slavery, the abolitionist movement. It's been in social movements that have understood that racism and sexism and inequality are embedded in American institutions and we have to root these out. That's how we've made our progress. And so the argument that I'm making is that we have to understand the foundations of the society in order to change the society. The other problem with the critical race theory rule is that this idea that the US was founded on universal principles sounds great, wish it were true, but it isn't because many ruling class people from the founding fathers on forward, and those of you that have read my book, African American Latinx History of the United States know that I went in and read the founding fathers, many of their papers. Um, I read the correspondence of this August family the Adams family, which was one of the most distinguished first founding families of American history. Think about it, a president, John Adams, a son, uh, 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 John Quincy Adams, a president and a very distinguished congressman, right? Charles Francis Adams, the grandson, one of the, the, the premier political uh, leaders of his time. Um, the Adams family is very shaky on things like universal principles. Charles Francis Adams said this out, it said this out very clearly here. He didn't believe in universal suffrage because he was concerned that universal suffrage would mean that you're going to give the votes to Irish people. You're going to give the votes to Chinese, to black people. Uh, you got to be kidding me. That's not how you, you create a polity. Okay. And so this is, this is a tendency in American political life opposed to the idea of the U S as being founded on universal principles. Uh, Andrew Carnegie didn't believe in universal principles. Um, he's making an extended argument here against the right of black people to vote. Essentially, he's supporting, Andrew Carnegie was a strong supporter of, of voter suppression against black people. He didn't believe in equality. Uh, and Florida loved Andrew Carnegie. Those of you who've read my, my uh, first monograph, Emancipation Betrayed, know that, that white Floridians especially those connected to the ruling class, the Democratic Party, which at that time was the party of white supremacy. They love to quote Andrew Carnegie. Imagine what a gift Andrew Carnegie, this Northern industrialist gives to the white supremacy uh, of force in Tallahassee in 1904, when he says black people shouldn't be allowed to vote. Okay, so again, another example of how the idea of universal principles um, is not really, um, uh, uh, was, wasn't really a thing in the United States. Um, you can make it up and you can say that we were founded on universal principles, but Andrew Carnegie and Charles Francis Adams would have disagreed with you. Uh, it's quite a different thing to say that we're fighting for that now, right? We're fighting for equality. We're fighting for everyone to be equal. Um, but that's something we fought for through social movements that was not something inherent among the founding fathers. And again, if you read the correspondence between John Adams, John Quincy Adams, the brothers, and Charles Francis, you'll see that very clear. Another problem with the rule against critical race, you know, studying critical race theory, or, or, or um, the problem with, with failing to understand or, or failing to understand US history as a struggle over institutions is that you'd have to really have to cancel a lot of people um, in order to, to implement that law. Um, this is kind of a quiz. I'm not gonna read this whole passage for you. You can kind of read through it. Um, but this is a, um, a passage from a travel log. A very distinguished uh, visitor comes to the United States. He travels through a big part of what, what was then the United States in 1842. And he uh, writes a very famous book, um, which people get very upset with him about, but he is, it's essentially, it's an extended critique of American society in 1842. And he says essentially, and he's European, I'll give you a, a hint, uh, he's actually English, I'll give you another hint. And he basically comes back to, to England and he writes this book. And of course, US Americans don't like it because the writer essentially says, this is not a nation really based upon universal principles. 
there's a lot of discrimination here. Wow, it's very anti-Black. It's very pro-slavery. It's very anti-Native American. Um, the prison system is not good. Um, there's a lot of problems with corruption here that need to be rooted out. And this writer says, I write this in the spirit of friendliness. I want my brother Americans to be able to have the tools they need to root out the corruption which is overtaking the society. This person is none other than Charles Dickens. So Charles Dickens's book, American Notes in 1842, would have been banned by the Florida Citizens Alliance if they knew about the book. I doubt they've read the book. I doubt Governor DeSantis has read the book. But really tough critiques, and I would call these tough love critiques. And these are the types of critiques I think that the rule is aimed against, uh, the, the anti-critical race theory rule. Because again, what Charles Dickens is saying is that discrimination here in the US is not based upon individual bias, right? Which is what the Florida statute against critical race theory is written to, to claim that prejudice is just the result of individual bias. What Charles Dickens is talking about is systemic problems, right? An entire institution, in this case, Congress, Remember, Dickens is um, observing from the, the Congressional Gallery in 1842 during a time when the U.S. House has the so-called gag rule, and one is not even allowed to talk about slavery. Okay, that's what the gag rule is, and if you talk about slavery in Congress, um, then you get into big trouble. And wow, it doesn't sound like the First Amendment is protected to me in that in the gag rule, right? And so... Dickens, of course, is shocked, and here he riffs on, and by the way, this is kind of a promotion for our lecture tomorrow, because I'll be at Okamak virtually talking about Charles Dickens' American Notes. I'm so excited. This is such an amazing, uh, incredible uh, book, and I think we're, we're starting um, a bit after lunchtime. But Dickens here actually uses the Declaration of Independence. He kind of riffs off the Declaration of Independence to point out um, how, yeah, this is not really a, a, a society based upon equal justice. There's a lot of bad things happening here. And you may not like it to, 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 to take a look in the mirror, Americans, but you're going to have to do it. And the last thing I'll say about this is that it's very emotional for me to think about this because, I mean, my gosh, uh, Charles Francis Adams is making this argument in a later generation for uh, the suppression of black votes, right? Charles Dickens is in the United States in 1842, shortly after John Quincy Adams, Charles Francis Adams' father, makes one of the most incredible speeches against slavery that will ever be delivered in the US Congress. And he makes this wonderful speech against the US's uh, impending invasion of Mexico. The U.S. is constantly sending military patrols into Mexico. And John Quincy Adams gets up for the floor of Congress and denounces both U.S. imperialism and slavery and connects those things. But he never says, this is the problem, this is a problem of individual bias. He says, this is a problem the entire nation has to, to grapple with. Now, I'm just going to go through some, a few more historical slides to give us a little bit of comparative context. Again, the understanding, the, the argument is that um, racism, imperialism, colonialism, inequality were not based upon indiv individual bias, but legal systems and policies, right? And so these are two famous murals. Many of you have seen these murals. I use them in my seminars. And what Laura Gomez, the, the distinguished scholar, says about these is that both the Spanish, and I'm quoting her directly, Professor Gomez, uh, both the Spanish and the American colonial enterprises were grounded in racism in a system of status inequality built upon presumed racial difference. And you can see here again the idea of intersectionality. Remember that Professor Crenshaw promotes um, this idea that you have to understand the oppression of indigenous peoples and also of African slaves. That's what the two different murals are trying to get out from different, different vantage points. These are murals, by the way, which you can view uh, in person uh, in Mexico City. But you see here very clearly that the foundations of colonialism in the Americas are based upon things that we would prefer to ignore, 
right? We prefer to forget, but that we can never forget, that we have to remember in order to root out the, the legacies of these systemic inequalities uh, that continue to plague our society today. Remember that the Florida statute requires us to study slavery, the Civil War, and things around those things, right? So how do we understand the origins of the Civil War by just using individual bias as a lens of analysis? That's rather absurd. Instead, um, I like to rely upon Frederick Douglass. He's giving us here a systemic analysis of why the Civil War happened in, in, his, in, in the way that Douglass said it, why the United States brought the Civil War upon ourselves, okay? He's saying history isn't just one darn thing after the other. He's saying that you, he's pointing at his audience in Philadelphia in 1862, by the way, in the, this is in the middle of the Civil War, y'all. And he's essentially saying that you brought the Civil War upon yourselves because you waged war against Native Americans. You invaded Mexico. You crushed freedom of speech. You attacked the abolitionists. You refused to recognize Haiti and Liberia. Um, you have degraded yourself in order to put yourself in alliance with your friends down south. And guess what happened? We told you, right? And by the way, Dickens also, this is part of American Notes in 1842, Charles Dickens predicted that the American Civil War was coming because he listened to abolitionists with that same critique. By the 18, early 1840s, it was, it was um, pretty obvious that unless the US could find the courage to abolish slavery, that it was going to destroy itself, which in fact it did 25 years later, unfortunately. So again, a systemic analysis the Civil War not created by individual biases, but a whole system of inequality and, and, and oppression. We remember again that now all 67 school districts are required to teach about the Okoye Election Day Massacre in, in Okoye, Florida, 1920. And again, the Okoye Massacre was not the result of individual bias. It was the result of systemic racism. And when I lecture about the Okoye Massacre, um, I talk about the fact that it occurs in this, this era of anti-Black pogroms, many of which were directed by white ruling class elites who were trying to get Black land and trying to push Black people off the land. And so a common narrative is that at the beginning, uh, before this particular anti-Black pogrom, whether it was in Ocoee, or Rosewood, or Elaine, or Tulsa, or or any of these places, or Forsyth County, Georgia, before there were a lot of black landowners. Black people were making significant economic strides. And then the massacre or the so-called riot hits, and then white people take over that land and black people are driven off of the land. That is a common story, unfortunately, in American history. And it's not driven by just individuals. I mean, look, the Elaine massacre was carried out in part by federal troops. Federal troops from, from that coming back from World War I were directed to go into Phillips County, Arkansas, and they shot down and murdered scores or perhaps hundreds of African-American people. The institutions that covered up these massacres, like, like the, reason we, we, the reason we can't probably never know the entire story of Ocoee, systemic cover-ups by law enforcement, uh, by the state of Florida, by the U.S. Congress, right? Um, again, these, these anti-Black racist episodes created not by individual bias, but by systemic foundational racism. And you can see here just, and, and this is just a partial list of anti-Black pogroms um, that occurred between 1898 and the, the Rosewood Massacre um, of 1923. So kind of moving towards the conclusion, I mentioned the Holocaust. I wanted to cycle back to the Holocaust because, again, this is in the Florida statutes for K through 12 education that we must teach about the origins of the Holocaust. When I think about how you do that, um, Professor Hannah Arendt's name comes to mind. She wrote The Brilliant Origins of Totalitarianism. She wrote The Incredible Eichmann in Jerusalem. 
but it's in the first half of Origins that she tells us the essentially the European chronology that will lead directly to the Nazi Holocaust of World War II. Racism and colonialism are at the root foundation causes of anti-Semitism and the Holocaust. What, what essentially Professor Arendt says is that Europeans went through these centuries of sending out troops and colonial and settler colonists into the Americas, into Africa, into Asia. They never thought about what would happen when, when those folks started coming back to the mother countries. They thought that you could sequester white supremacy and, and the British could practice it in India, the Germans could practice it in East Africa, the French could practice it in North Africa, and that there wouldn't be any repercussions on the home countries. Fools, tragically misplaced fools. If you read Origins of Totalitarianism, you know that essentially it's an analysis of the chickens coming home to roost. When the European mob discovered what a lovely virtue a white skin could be in Africa, when the English conqueror in India uh, became an administrator who no longer believed in the universal validity of law, because that's what racism is essentially is, right? Those people start coming back to the metropoles in the late 19th century, the early 20th century, and essentially this is a ticking time bomb. And it's the racism, it's the colonialism, it's the imperialism, which will eventually boomerang back to Europe and will create the, the conditions that lead to the Nazi Holocaust. And again, I want us to understand this because the way that Professor Arendt thinks about the origins of the Holocaust, again, it's not just individual biases that are at, at, at play here. It's not just whether one person is anti-Semitic and another person is not. It's entire systems of racism, anti-Semitism. In this case, Arendt is concerned primarily with imperialism, with bureaucracy, with colonialism, and um, the idea of treating people as lesser than, as inferior, right? That's what colonialism is essentially uh, built to do, to, to pull, to, to expropriate great wealth from indigenous people in the Americas, from Indians in the subcontinent, um, from Algerians in North Africa, and to take that surplus wealth and use it to um, embellish and engorge European states and cultures. And Arendt said there's a price to pay for that and the price will be the Nazi Holocaust. And uh, it's a horrific price to pay. But again, I want us to, to remember that after World War II, we had this incredible opportunity to dig deeper into understanding origins of totalitarianism, uh, but many people turned against Dr. Arendt for one reason or the other, which I could, we can talk about um, in, in Q&A. Getting back to the United States, and, and again, this is the part of our history in this country we'd prefer not to, to recognize or not to, to understand, but the reality is, is that uh, a significant part of the Nazi, the German um, Nuremberg racial laws promulgated in 1935 were based upon United States Jim Crow laws, right? The Germans were sending people to the United States uh, beginning in the late 1920s, the Nazi party was and the state was when Hitler seizes power in 1933, they're sending legal experts to the US. We have a scholarship on this now. James Whitman is, is one of the many scholars who's worked on this problem. And essentially the Nazis learned much of their theory about race and the law from us, from the United States. And again, they learned it as a system of law, right? And they took that and they went back and they promulgate the Nuremberg race laws um, in, in 1935. Again, not an edifying aspect of US American history. Um, I, didn't, I certainly wasn't taught this in, in high school or even in college. Right, it, and but it's a really amazing, more recent uh, vein uh, in in American historiography, and it wasn't just the laws. Of course, it was corporations. Uh, many of us know that that Henry Ford, uh, another person, another powerful American who did not believe in universal principles, right, a raging anti-Semite, uh, Ford was a key ally of Adolf Hitler. Uh, the more recent literature on 
corporations like IBM and others who actually uh, worked hand in glove with the Nazis in the early 1930s. And again, this is not the point of all this is not to say, you know, kind of got you, you know, uh, we have these terrible things happen in this country. The point is, is to be honest. The point is to look ourselves, look, look at ourselves in the mirror and realize that the problem is within our society, within our culture, within our history. Let's do something about it. Okay. That's, that's why we, we do this kind of, of work. Um, and again, there's, there's a really uh, uh, an amazing literature about this. Now we'll move to action items. And again, we got to have some action, right? We can't just study history without there being some kind of, uh, of outcome in terms of creating a better society. So the main act, you know, one main action item is to remind not just Governor DeSantis, but all of our school districts that, hey, did you know that we have statutes and, and, and laws would say that we're supposed to be teaching about all these really important things, the study of Hispanic contributions to the United States, enslavement, abolitionism, uh, civil rights, the Holocaust. And to me, this is one of our best defenses against this more recent, this more recent kind of bad rule, which is to take the earlier rule, the earlier law, and say, you know, um, and you can do this as a parent, you can do this as an educator, you can do this as a concerned citizen. Um, you can go to a, a school district, uh, a school board meeting, your local, your local community. Um, you can write a letter, you can send an email. Um, and you can maybe ask the state of Florida an important question. State of Florida, you have added the study of the Ocoee massacre as something mandated that all Florida districts are supposed to teach. What about some resources to do that? Because everything here, believe it or not, all these, and this is, I love this, this section, by the way, this is wonderful. This is wonderful, for, especially as a historian, as an active citizen. But guess what? This is all, these are all unfunded mandates. So what about that? What about our underfunded schools? What about the fact that you have to go to a really well-endowed, almost elite school to get any of this history to begin with, right? So let's change that. Let's make our schools more equal. Let's make sure we teach about the Holocaust, about slavery, about civil rights, and let's do it candidly. Let's not play around. Let's not, you know, kind of do it softly. We, we have to be all in. And in conclusion, I'll say I'm really proud to be part of a community where people believe in these things, that these things should be taught. We have the, the great work you do at the United Church of Gainesville. Uh, we have the Alachua County Remembrance Committee. Uh, we have a lot of organizations in our, in our community that understand that if you love if you love the United States, um, you have to be frank, you have to be bold, right? If you be kind of like James Baldwin, he would say, you know, I love this country, that's why I'm so hard in this country, because I want it to be better. And unfortunately, Governor DeSantis's rule against, anti, uh, against critical race theory undermines our ability to look ourselves in the mirror and to be honest with ourselves about our nation's history. But I think we have the chance to, to, um, to, to change that now. So I'll stop now. Um, I can talk about this forever, but I know we want to have time for Q&A and, and discussion. So let me stop the, uh, the share here. Maybe, it, maybe I can start. Uh, there was a comment earlier on statute 1003.42 that Kali Blunt put in the chat. And since you closed with that, I'll, I'll read Kali's earlier comment while others are putting questions in the chat. But he noted that the original statute had its origins with the Florida Conference of Black State Legislators. All other areas were added to that kernel so as to gain broad support and possible passage, which first occurred in 1994. Sadly, never before Rep Representative Thompson's spurring of the state board in 2019 has compliance occurred in more than 10 counties in any given year. Alachua County's halting start in 2019 to 2020 had cannonball sized gaps in the presentation of early Alcabulan, um, probably mispronouncing that, Africa. Even 1003.42's first clause about examining the declaration 
includes the edits therefrom, with the largest and most literate being criticism of slavery. Um, so I just wanted to add that comment. Yeah, and Khalees, you know, as part of a statewide coalition of educators promoting the study of African American history, uh, we have a county, uh, a county uh, wide organization um, that that does that. I know uh, I see uh, Dr. Uh, Zara Simmons on the line on too, and she's been a part of that effort. Um, in part, I think because of the the fact that these are unfunded mandates, uh, it's really required people power to encourage the school districts to step up and offer these. You know, the problem is, you know, where do you get this content? And I'll just mention that for the Ekoi Massacre, you know, the Ekoi Massacre, frankly, is not taught uh, in, in Florida, hasn't been taught in general. And so the question of where that content comes from to learn about it, it takes engaged, um, you know, uh, his, history activists, you know, like, uh, Mr. Blunt, like Dr. Simmons, and, and many others we have in our in our county, because otherwise, people are just not being taught this this history. Well, people formulate their questions. I I have a question. Um, it, was, it was disturbing to to see how early Nazi Germany learned from our um, bad bad culture. Um, are there lessons that we can learn about how Germany has wrestled with their um, Holocaust past that could inform us as we wrestle with our own failures? Yes, I think there are many. I'm actually, for folks who joined um, after we started, I'm putting the, uh, a few people have asked about the Florida Department of Education rule that we're talking about today and when it was passed, um, it was promulgated in July. And I'm putting the, um, the text in the chat bar again for people in a Google doc, uh, so you can check that out. So this question about how states and nations commemorate, remember um, atrocities is a really important one. And it's a very lively debate um, in uh, West Germany and in East Germany after World War II, there were different strategies that those governments used. Um, Hannah Arendt's argument was that denazification in West Germany had largely um, failed uh, because too many former Nazis ended up be, uh, uh, becoming very prominent leaders in West German society. Um, there is a debate about um, uh, the reemergence of anti-Semitism in some of the Western European nations. What Germany did a better job in, I think, after World War II, though, was in trying, and I'm talking about West Germany and East Germany, in trying to commemorate and remember uh, in, in certain ways. But I think the real, the real prime example in my mind is not Germany or any other European state. It's actually South Africa. Um, and the creation of the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was chaired for many years, Arch Archbishop Desmond Tutu, um, again, a really challenging process to get people to come to the docket, as it were, and talk about crimes that were committed, you know, both crimes of the apartheid state, uh, but also acts of terrorism engaged in by the freedom fighters trying to end apartheid. And the idea was that you had to come and talk about what you had done uh, uh, before this public forum. And Bishop Tutu was asked, you know, about this, you know, about his experiences in Truth, Re Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And then he was asked about the United States and, you know, what would, you know, what would such a commission look like in the United States? And he said, well, it's clear that the United States needs something like this and that its, its failure to really come to grips with its racial history has created a lot of problems for it as, as a nation. Now, of course, he said this back in the mid nineties when the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa was really going strong. I'm sure a lot of you um, were following those. Uh, Guatemala had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, one of my mentors, um, Greg Grandin, was actually an interpreter for that commission in Guatemala 
which was looking at the atrocities committed, especially against indigenous peoples uh, in that country. And so different nations have tried different things. Um, the U.S. tried uh, to avoid those things for many, many years and decades, generations. Um, but I, you, know, you could argue now, if you look at an organization like the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama, um, I think they're doing an amazing job there. Um, they're just one organization, of course, but I just took 16 University of Florida students there in uh, last month, and it was eye-opening for people. You know, both the museum, there's a museum in Montgomery called From Slavery to Mass Incarceration. You go through that museum, you spend a few hours there, and then you go about a quarter mile down the road, and then you're, you're in the National Memorial for, for Peace and Justice, and which is an uh, dedicated to the victims of lynching. And it's such a profound experience. And, and for some of our students, it's the first time they have found out that, that lynchings occurred in their county uh, because they go right to their home county, right? Whether they're, they come from Florida or Georgia, et cetera. And they'll come back and they'll say, wow, Professor Ortiz, I didn't know we had lynchings in, uh, in my county. I was never told that. And that, and there's these incredible cathartic experiences that occur. Um, and so that, that's one organization I think in the US, which is really doing things right, um, the, the Equal Justice Initiative. I think we had a comment. We had a comment from a colleague that I forwarded. Um, I won't read the whole thing because it's in the chat, but essentially I think uh, the, the gist was about the perception um, of Moorish uh, sailors who came into cities um, as they were as they were arriving, and how that information was that peace was admitted in local schools um, during the debut year of the African and African American history. Oh yeah, looking at the chat now. Yeah. Well, you know, and another thing about this, and, and when we get to the foundations of studying, you know, the foundations of, of racism, I mean, a lot of this, and again, why I teach racism and anti-Semitism really connected together is that it's 1492 when what had been the Iberian Peninsula essentially consolidates uh, under what becomes the Spanish Empire. And really the first substantial rule or law of that empire is to essentially expel and suppress uh, Moors or Muslims uh, and Jews. And there's a number of laws passed over the next centuries about expelling both, uh, uh, both groups, uh, about suppressing their religious uh, practices, about oppressing them, about expelling them to North Africa. Uh, many people were killed. And that, and 1492, as we know, is critical to the colonization of the Americas, those things are connected. And so the, the Spanish and the Europeans bring those, the, the racist and anti-Semitic attitudes they developed in the Iberian Peninsula and in Western Europe, et cetera, they bring those with them to, uh, to the Americas. Okay, I have two questions and I think they're related. So I'll, I'll ask them together. They're, these are from participants. Can you say more about why the folks behind the laws would want to suppress this knowledge? And the other was, can you comment on the political reasons for all of this anti-1619 project and anti-critical race theory? Well, this is a question I want us to kind of think about collectively if we were, if we were kind of in a space and we could kind of hash this out. Um, I just mentioned two groups, Campus Reform and the Florida Citizens Alliance. Now, the Florida Citizens Alliance doesn't want K through 12 students to read Toni Morrison. Now, why is that? Let, let's, let's think about that for a moment. Why would you, and then why would you be opposed to studying race and racism as systems? Why would you be opposed to trying to dig deeper into US history? And what would be the political payoffs behind doing that? Um, and why would the Koch network put so many resources into doing this? Because remember, this isn't just a Florida thing. Um, and and I, I realize I've made a mistake here that, that my, my, my uh, presentation was a little flawed because we wanted to focus on the Florida rule, right? 
But I forgot to mention also that this rule has been passed or people have attempted to pass this in about 32 states at last count. So it's a national movement, if you will. And the funny thing about this is that most people, when they've been called on this, when they've been actually uh, um, called to do uh, by reporters to do interviews on television, there, you may have seen some of these, the reporter will say, um, well, what is critical race theory? And the people opposed to it will say, well, what do you think critical race theory is? In other words, they don't even know what it is, right? Um, so I'm just kind of throwing these things out, out there to say that I think that the people opposed to this, there are people that just don't really want us to do a deep dive into U.S. history. And we can think about the political reasons for that. And there, there, are, there are too many to even think about to just talk about briefly. But I think part of it is they want to undermine our ability to change things, okay? Because a, a big part of the study of, if you think about it, a lot of this is, I think it's aimed at the Black Lives Matter movement. So the Black Lives Matter movement has been urging us to go back and study US institutions, to study policing, to study the courts, to study the laws. And I think that, well, Governor DeSantis doesn't want us to do that. I'll just say right off the bat, that I don't think that the Florida Citizens Alliance wants us to really do a deep dive into slavery. Why would they spend so much time trying to stop us from reading Toni Morrison in our K through 12 system? Um, but you know what's coming next? I mentioned that the Florida Citizens Alliance is also trying to get Pearson's oceanography out of public schools. How many of you here have read Pearson's oceanography? Uh, probably not many of us because we're not in ninth grade uh, science class, right? But you know why they're trying to get Pearson's oceanography out of the curriculum for public schools, right? Because they don't want people studying about global climate change. Because if you study about global climate change, then you might be able to do something about it, right? Just like if you study about racism, you might be able to do something about it. That is, you might be able to challenge it, okay? And so I think that this is part of a political movement. Um, I'm in danger here of, of sounding like a conspiracy theorist, but in many cases, you know, the, the conspiracy is kind of wide open, right? It's, 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 it's in front of our, our, our plates. It's that, you know, uh, don't question people in power. That's the bottom line. They don't want us to know. Governor DeSantis doesn't want you to know how to change things. He wants you to agree with him. What's my proof for that? Every time any county in the state of Florida tries to pass a local ordinance um, saying, hey, we don't want, you know, we don't want plastic containers. We want to pay a little higher wage to people that work here. What does Tallahassee do to us? Not just Gainesville, but the entire state. This is what a lot of the, and I'll get into politics here now. This is what a lot of the Trump movement is all about. It's about controlling your local community. And it's about saying that your local community cannot be trusted to protect your local citizenry, that we have to defend you. Governor DeSantis has to defend you from the New York liberals, from the leftist radicals that run universities. It's clear by now you should know this. I really run the University of Florida, right? Um, so Governor DeSantis has to protect you from people like me, okay? He has to protect you from those people who want to pass laws mitigating the impact of plastics on the environment. And that is, that's, that's nationwide now. That's part of what I would call the Trump movement. And I think that these laws against critical race theory are part and parcel of that. They're connected to it. It's like, well, don't study this. Take my word for it. Um, don't really dig deeply into that aspect of American history because you may find flaws in the Republic. And I'm not saying this is brand new because, and I'll talk about this more at Okamic tomorrow, when Charles Dickens published American Notes, he lost a lot of friends in the United States. I mean, people like Washington Irving, I mean, high, you know, his, you know these great literary characters. And it really broke his heart. Um, but, he understood what would happen because he said, you know, one of the flaws of the American character that I really want you all to work on is you can't take criticism. Uh, 
no nation, of course, likes the criticism, right? But he said there's something about American character that any time of, any type of criticism, no matter how, how mild, is taken as an assault upon the entire you know culture and society. Um, and he was trying to get Americans to really to 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 kind of just kind of take it easy there, right? And 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 accept that criticism. Um, In the 16, oh, the 1619 Project, just uh, um, about that, the argument about that curriculum, and of course, it's it wasn't a curriculum, it wasn't being used, and it's kind of like critical race theory in a sense that it wasn't even being used uh, in Florida, to my knowledge. Um, I could be wrong about this, but I don't know any school district that had implemented the 1619 curriculum in the state of Florida or in the Deep South. The argument against that curriculum, and again, we could spend hours talking about the curriculum. Um, I think it's a very important curriculum, but like any historical curriculum, it has interpretations, it has analyses, it has um, uh, opinions, right? And you can agree or disagree with those, but one of the things that people who uh, uh, passed the law against the 1619 um, uh, uh, curriculum, which is in that anti-critical race theory um, rule, their critique of it is that, uh, why do you talk so much about slavery? You know, why do you talk so much about racism? Uh, the US was founded on universal principles of, of equality. Um, don't, you know, you can't make slavery the central uh, uh, event in American history um, if the nation was founded on universal principles, okay? Or you have to kind of go back to an early historical argument, which is the U.S. is a land of paradox, right? And so that's, I think, a lot of what the problem about that people have about the 1619 curriculum is they believe it, it overemphasizes the impact of slavery and the role of slavery in American history. Um, I have to say that I disagree with that. I think that slavery is a defining element of, of U.S. American culture. But I want to emphasize that's a historical debate, okay? But how it became politicized is to me just as interesting. Because again, very few people are going to go and read Professor Crenshaw's founding texts on critical race theory, okay? Very few people are going to go back and read the 1619 Project. Probably more people have read the 1619 Project because it was published in the New York Times after all. But even there, uh, it's not going to be um, something which is going to be popular or even taught very often in Florida school districts. And so why would you even raise it? I think there's going to be a backlash, by the way, and I'll kind of, maybe I'll conclude this part in a hopeful note. I think that, I think at this moment in Florida, as similar to what happened in Arizona in the uh, uh, early part of last decade, when, when Tucson Unified School District you know, one of the largest school districts in the country banned Mexican-American studies. And that's what they did. They banned the teaching of Mexican-American studies in the school district. Um, they argued that Mexican-American studies was teaching hatred against white people uh, in schools which were composed 90 to 98% of primarily Hispanic students. Um, but then that caused a backlash that they could, they never would have anticipated. The backlash was, suddenly all these states organizing and fighting for ethnic studies. And I just finished, by the way, I was an expert review panel member for the state of Connecticut. And, and this, is, this is my hopeful note again, where um, Governor DeSantis is really fighting against the grain here. He's already lost the battle. One example is the state of Connecticut, three or four years ago, students, teachers, parents, educators, and this is a call for action, by the way, for all of us, this incredible coalition came together in, in the state of Connecticut, the entire state, to demand the teaching of Black history in K-12 school, public schools in Connecticut. And then a parallel movement formed of a lot of first-generation immigrants and, and also Puerto Ricans and other Latinos to demand the teaching of Latino studies in Connecticut's K through 12 system. And eventually those two movements coalesced 
and they were able to pass two state laws that passed two years ago, requiring the teaching of now African-American, Puerto Rican, and Latino histories. Uh, so in order to graduate from Connecticut public school system, you have to take those courses and it's a two course sequence, okay? So I spent about a year or so as expert review uh, panelist for that curriculum. It's an incredible curriculum. And it's so inspiring because, I mean, I get inspired anytime I find out that there's high school students protesting and sitting in and demanding the right to learn more, to read more. I mean, isn't that cool? I mean, imagine doing a sit-in where you demand to read more. I'm like, I'm down for that as a historian, right? And so Connecticut and other states, you probably read about California, uh, New Mexico, there's a movement now. I think that this, the, that what DeSantis has tried to do in Florida is going to create its own backlash that is going to be very similar in the sense that I don't have to make the argument anymore about why history matters, why history is important. When you, have a, when you have the governor of a state of 23 million people who attacks history, you no longer have to make that argument about why history matters. The state of Florida did it for us, right? Uh, Paul, let me uh, interrupt here for a second. Uh, we've advertised these uh, Sunday seminars to go for one hour. We know that your uh, voice is not going to hold out forever, but we certainly very much want to thank you for this uh, marvelous uh, one hour that we've had with you today. We'd like to invite you to stay on for some more questions, but we realize that, um, uh, you know, everybody has to have lunch and has to rest their vocal cords occasionally, but we want to say thank you, thank you, thank you, and if you can, can you stay on for some more Q&A with us? Sure, yeah, I'd be happy to. Thank you, and thanks everyone. Thanks for being such a great patient audience. Some people are gonna to have to drop off here after their hour, but um, but we would love to stay with you for a little while longer, okay? Yeah. Thank you very much. So the next question uh, had to do with the rights call for a new civil war. Uh, with new laws on voting reform, Tucker Carlson promoting Orban and the quote, expected triumphal return of Trump, unquote, on the 13th, where would you put us today on the timeline from Dickens' notes to the Civil War? Well, the struggle against black voter suppression is as real as it has ever been. I mean, it's, you know, it's a continuity in US history is the efforts of people at the top of the society to suppress black voting. And again, I want us to think about why that is. Why is the franchise exercised by African Americans deemed by powerful people in this country to be so dangerous uh, and to be so threatening to elite power? So that's something that we're going to have to protect and defend. And all of us have got to be part of that struggle. I know that a few years ago, many of us on this call participated, for example, in one of the most inspirational social movements I've ever been a part of or even have read about. Uh, which was that struggle to um, help regain the voting rights or restore the voting rights of convicted felons. And we were statewide, we were able to, to, to garner more than 1 million signatures. And I know that the NAACP and the, the Dream Defenders and the Alachua County Labor Coalition were especially active in this area. I know a lot of people from UCG participated in that campaign. And I want us to think about why that was important, because it kind of gets to the core of Khalid's question in the sense that um, there's a struggle to take voting rights away from African-Americans, especially, and then also away from Haitian-Americans, away from Latinos, away from working class people. And then there's the, the struggle to, to defend those voting rights. I think that all of us, regardless of our identities, have to be involved in. It's a struggle to, to, uh, or to defend democracy. You know, Dickens, when Dickens made that call in 1842 about the U.S. heading towards a war, heading towards a civil war, he didn't invent that again. I want to emphasize that. He was borrowing that from the radical abolitionists who developed that critique, by the way, as early as the 1810s and even earlier. Um, and even people like Benjamin Franklin, right? He, Jill Lepore's um, latest book, uh, uh, these truths has this incredible poignant moment where Benjamin Franklin is really basically on his way to, to, to transitioning, to dying, right? And he tries to give this message to the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia saying, 
look, y'all, we've got to, we've got, we've got to get rid of slavery. Slavery is going to destroy this whole thing. Okay. And he's, he breaks his heart. He's not able to go to Philadelphia to, to the convention to do this himself. Um, you know, Thomas Paine, Richard Allen, Frederick Douglass. I mean, the list goes on and on of people who in the early 1800s were saying, if you don't, if we don't abolish slavery now, it's going to lead to the most horrific kind of war you can imagine. And uh, in fact, it did so. So the, the time we're in now is a very dangerous time, unless we can get people to get active um, and to, to combat things like black voter suppression, to combat police brutality, to combat um, educational inequality. I think all of us are, are, are playing roles in that. I mean, I would just say, just keep, you know, keep fighting because we, we know what happens when we give up the battle. I mean, just imagine if we allow the Florida, um, that, that Florida Citizens Alliance to ban all of Toni Morrison's books, what a devastating blow that would be to K through 12 education. Um, and so I, I think right now we're kind of, um, it's kind of up in the air, but um, we know that if we're not active, we know that if we're not forming social movements to support equality and justice, uh, 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 we know what's gonna happen it's, and, and it's, it's not gonna be good. Uh, Tim, you want to read out the next one? If there is another question, I didn't see any questions, more comments in the chat. Yeah, there were, there were several comments, uh, many of them learned as, as usual in this group. One of them from Sheila Payne said, I'm concerned that this state law is already chilling K-12 teachers and their attempts to teach American history. I've heard from some who are teaching African-American history using primary documents are afraid they'll be disciplined. And then there was another uh, comment from uh, Gwendolyn Simmons um, that I'm scrolling down for um, that I wanted to read. Oh, shoot. <laughs> I lost it. Oh, I can see that. Um, do you want me to read it? Sure. OK. So Dr. Simmons' uh, chat comment is, I did a workshop in African-American studies this summer with K-12 teachers across the U.S. Almost all were using the 1619 curriculum. A number of them have been threatened and told to stop. And so what Dr. Simmons is doing here, this is part of the answer, is to get out and if you, if you have the skill set, do these workshops uh, on African-American studies. If you don't, then demand them, request them. Make sure that your school district is teaching. I mean, what is the Alachua County uh, School Board curriculum on the Ecole Massacre now? I'm just kind of throwing that out there. I don't know, I should know that, I'm ignorant of that. So let's make sure that we're implementing that curriculum. You don't have to be an educator to, to do that. You can, you can tell the school board, your local school board, hey, these are the rules. These are the things we should be teaching the students. This dovetails to Sheila Payne's comment, which is that before this law was passed, or the rule, I'm sorry, was passed in July against critical race theory and the 1619 curriculum project, um, uh, Florida school teachers were already feeling the heat. And this is another action item, is we need to really support and lift up our teachers who are trying to teach the truth in history in schools. Uh, we need to lift up and support our teachers who are teaching science. We need to lift up and support our teachers who are teaching, you know, civics, anything like, uh, let, let's say we need to support all of our teachers, right, in public schools, because they're really in the front lines. Um, a lot of my former students are teachers in Florida. And unfortunately, I have to say, many of them have left Florida um, and they went to teach in other states because of the repressive attitude towards teachers and public education in Florida. So that's part of our, I think that would be part of what I would, 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 would say would be an action item here would be to find out how we can support our schools in teaching this knowledge. But we've had a lot of great victories recently. Okay, so we had, um, and I see some of you on the call here who supported the, um, uh, the push to rename J.J. Finley Elementary to transition to, to Carolyn Parker Elementary, right? 
that was such an important local movement. It was important because students, uh, high school students, UF students, Santa Fe College students, educators, parents got involved, right? And they went and uh, of course, as Dr. Simmons knows, they contacted us right away and they said, tell us about JJ Finley. And it took no more than two or three hours of research to, and we knew a little bit about him before, but it didn't take long to be able to tell the school board very honestly and with much candor, look, this is a person a school should never and ever have been named after. Uh, uh, and even judged by the, the, uh, um, the analysis of his own peers, uh, was not a person a school should ever be named for. So let's do the right thing. Uh, it wasn't seamless, but we changed the name of that elementary school. And that's, that's another great example of what we can do with, with some people power. Um, I, I could tell you some kind of, um, I'll, I'll tell you just one harrowing story that my former, one of my former students told me uh, not too long ago, um, which is that, um, and again, this is an action item for all of us. And so what she told me, and she teaches in a, a, in a South Florida school district, um, is that in her school district in January, uh, when some, not all, when some of the white parents know that, she, and she's a social studies teacher, when they know that, that the social studies teachers are going to talk about Martin Luther King Jr., um, some of the parents actually pull their children out of the school so that they don't have to learn about Dr. King. Um, and she, uh, she was in tears about this and very, uh, very upset you know, why is this? And so we kind of talk one-on-one -on -one about it. Um, she's been working with a racial uh, equity group among teachers in her county to try to figure out how to, to change this. Um, because she's saying, you know, I don't want to attack the parents. I know who, who some of them are. The point is, is to get everyone in the room together and to, and to talk this through and to let them know why it's important for our students to learn about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., you know, and um, so this, I just share that with you to kind of echo what Sheila Payne was saying. Our teachers are, were already under a lot of pressure to begin with. And we really need to, to again, be allies with them, to lift them up, um, to, to try to support public education. I just read how Governor DeSantis um, is trying to pass some kind of rule against what he calls COVID bullying. And saying that if uh, if a parent feels that their their student is being bullied into wearing a mask, they're going to be sent to a private institution where they can go to school, and the public taxpayers are going to pick up pick up the bill for that, right? And that's another. I, I see all these things as efforts to really undermine public education in our state, and that's a battle we have to understand. If we want public schools to continue to exist, we're really going to have to step in, uh, step up and defend them. Um, I wanted to read one final comment that I think is a nice wrap up from Kali, and then I'll hand it over to Fletch to close us down. But he says, lots of folks in this call and others we could recruit could make themselves available as school volunteers to bring guest presentations in various subjects, supercharged way to support teachers. And when you have to shoo those kids out to get to the next class, you'll know they have engaged. So that, that's another great call to action. And I'll hand it off to Fletch to finish this up. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tim. Thank you very much. Uh, Paul, we want to give you a great big round of applause here, a, a Zoom applause. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, we want to be sure to have you come back to UCG here one of these days with some uh, real upbeat news, OK? So, so uh, keep the faith, baby. And uh, right. thank you very much for being a spokesman for uh, for non whitewashing of American history. That's a, it's a, it's an uphill battle, we know, but we uh, admire you for doing that, and we want to say thank you today. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks for attending. See you next Sunday.